for Dan Lanning and the Ducks to hit their ceiling in 2024, they don't need to change a thing. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. So we'll talk about Dan Lanning, Mateo Uyungle, Bo Nix, the whole nine yards coming up on uh, today's show, then some basketball talk at the very end of the program today. But I think for Oregon, the Ducks are in a position going into the 12-team playoff era where nothing actually needs to change. There don't need to be you know, more personnel moves. They don't need to have a philosophical change. And that hasn't always been the case. When you watched Oregon in 2019, sure, they won the Rose Bowl and the Pac-12 championship because they had Justin Herbert and a bunch of butt-kicking players on defense. Kayvon Thibodeau and maybe the best secondary we've seen in Oregon in the last 15 years or so. That, That unit was absolutely positively disgusting. But philosophically, a change could have benefited that team on offense. They were stagnant. They were predictable. The, the, the pistol was just not working very well. And when Joe Moorhead came in, I felt that that was a really good move and that they'd upgraded at the offensive coordinator position. Oregon is in a great spot right now because none of those sorts of changes need to happen. They don't need to happen on offense. I don't think they even need to happen on defense. This is a transfer portal class that is going to make an impact. This is a high school recruiting class that might have a couple players that make an impact in 2024. It's a roster filled with a bunch of returners, and it's a scheme and a coaching staff that is largely the same and was incredibly good in 2023. So I think that for Oregon, there, there was an element of not hitting their ceiling that, that just stemmed from them's the breaks. I honestly think that. I honestly, I don't think Dan Lanning needs to rethink his defense. I don't think he needs to rethink the roster or the type of players that he's getting or anything. I think that he is doing everything to move Oregon in the right direction. And he's got the program in the direction that he wants it to be. And I think that's a great thing for the Ducks. And it should have Oregon fans excited about 2024. And Oregon should be one of the two top contending teams in the Big Ten next year alongside Ohio State. That should be the expectation. That should be the expectation because when you look at what this roster is, what they did last year, the players that are coming back, Oregon led the Pac-12, which was the deepest conference in America. They led them in points per game, or led it, I guess you'd say, the conference, RIP. Led it in points per game on offense, led it in points per game on defense, led it in yards per game on offense, third in yards per game on defense, best passing defense in the Pac-12 I think that the year one to year two improvements for Dan Lanning as a head coach and as a staff were on display because in year one, there were defensive struggles. I remember going back to that 2022 season, it was a disappointing end in a big way, got off to a horrible start, then it was really good, and then two or three down the stretch, it was not great. And I felt that in those moments, Dan Lanning was showing his youth as a head coach. Well, guess what? I think that he took a big step forward. He can still get better. Shouldn't have lost that second game to Washington. And that one is on the coaching staff as much as anybody. But I don't see an indication that the staff isn't going to continue to get better, that the players are not going to continue to get better as well. And I think all the foundational elements for Oregon to be good this year in the Big Ten and the following year and the following, it's all there. They recruit high school kids well. They recruit portal kids well. They develop kids well. Look at guys like Jaleel Florence, who I was talking about on yesterday's show, how much better he was from year one to year two. And I'll talk about Mateo and what he needs to do going into year two to help the Ducks defense later in the show. But I also look at a guy like Jeffrey Bossa, who came in as a safety, moved down to linebacker, and in 2022, he, along with the defense, struggled. It is not a coincidence that Jeffrey Boss's improved play 
correlated with improved defensive play because that's the signal caller. That's the guy who is the middle linebacker, so to speak. I know they don't, you know, they have a mic and a money backer, but it's not a traditional 4-3 or anything, but Boss is the leader defensively. Everybody understands that. And having him back is so big for next year. But for him to go from a guy that took plenty of criticism, deservedly so, because of how he played in 2022, to a guy who hits the weight room, changes his body, keeps his speed, and is a a, a centerpiece on a defense that leads the Pac-12 in points per game allowed and and garners second-team all-conference in the process, that's a tremendous feather in the cap of Dan Lanning and the rest of that defense. And Dan Lanning is a guy who, I correct me if I am wrong here, but I believe I am right, when he was at Georgia, he was the D.C. and the linebackers coach. That That's where he you know specialized when he was a position guy, and then he was a defensive coordinator, and now, of course, he's Oregon's head coach. And I think seeing that position thrive and seeing Jeffrey Bossa, who's also an awesome guy, I, I, I think it's a really, really good sign. And I, I don't think anything needs to change schematically. I don't think anything needs to change philosophically on either side of the ball. Uh, I mean, if you look at this Oregon team and the way they performed in 2023, yep, Washington had their number on those two days. So they came up three points short twice against a team that was good enough to win a national championship. That's where they were in year two. In year two. Dan Lanning's never been a head coach before he came to Oregon. Well, now he's a head coach for all of two seasons. And these expectations are already being placed on him as Oregon fans. And guess what? I think that it's fair in a lot of respects because he is compensated accordingly. And I think that's the standard that he holds himself to as much as anybody. And that's the way that Oregon fans, with everything that this program has become and everything it can continue to be, that's where the expectation is. And and I just think that Lanning has done a great job in so many ways of – making sure that there is an element of sustainability to what he is building and what he is doing for the Ducks right now. And I think that it is there. It doesn't feel like a flash in the pan. It's not a reset for Oregon in 2024. It's a reload. Now, there are some spots where I think it's tough to match the talent level you had a season ago. We'll see if Jamari Caldwell can be as good as Brandon Dorless. Dorless led the team in sacks last year and was our best defensive lineman. That's a tough, that's a t- I know Caldwell's tremendously talented, the transfer from Houston, who was all conference last year, I think second team selection, good football player, big guy, run stuffer, can get after the quarterback as well, had six and a half sacks. That's a tough spot to, per, to, to, to replicate. Brandon Doyle is just a tough player to replace. But I think that the way that Oregon has gone about this offseason has just been tremendously smart. Because they're going and getting the best caliber players they can. They're attacking needs. I I never feel like Oregon, since Lanning has taken over, has left a stone unturned on the roster pursuit front. What I mean by that is when Oregon has a need, can you think of a time, if you're listening to or watching the show right now, can you think of a time where Oregon had a clear need of, boy, you know, Gonzo's going to the NFL draft. Well, what did they do? They brought in Kyrie Jackson via the portal from Alabama last year, second team all-conference selection. Man, Brandon Dorless is kind of the only guy on that defensive line. What did they do? They, they brought in Jordan Birch. Yeah, that went really well. Happy to have Birch back next year. I think the way they manage the roster, they, they have a clear understanding of where their needs are, how they can go get them, and they've got the resources to go out and get these sorts of players, and that's what they need to be doing. So I I just feel great about where Lanning is. This is what, the more I think about it, the expectation is going to be year in, year out. Compete in the Big Ten. Be one of the top two or three teams up there. There are other programs that, that have got money and brand and great coaches and great players and everything like that. I don't expect the Ducks to win it every year, but right now, As I sit here recording this show late night on January 22nd, 2024, fully expect Oregon to be a Big Ten contender annually with Lanning because I think he's done uh, that great of a job. Player development. Coaches understand its importance. Fans oftentimes ask about player development and want to know, well, can he develop guys? Can he develop this guy and them? 
as I talked about. I think Lanning can do that, and I'm excited to see what he could do with Mateo Uyunglele. I'm excited, as always, to tell you about FanDuel because the NFL regular season, well, that's yesterday's news. The playoffs, however, still in full swing. There are three games left in the NFL season, and there's time to get in on the action with FanDuel. That's America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. When you, when you place just a $5 bet, that's all it takes. That's all it takes. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, whether you win or lose. The app is super easy to use. You can do live same game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab, make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, all that and so much more. So go check out fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. Fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel, official partner of the NFL. That thought I had came in via the mailbag, which is always open, YouTube comments or on X, formerly known as Twitter, at S. McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. DMs and mentions are wide open all the time. If you want priority access, go over to Subtext, free 14-day trial, then it's just $5 a month, absolutely not a requirement. You do get all sorts of perks over there. This question came in from the flock over in the Subtext community. What changes do we see in game planning for the Ducks in 24? More of the same or any wholesale changes? Looking forward, what should we expect in the spring game? Where does the Duck rate in the Big Ten mascots? Duck is number one. I mean, come on. I, 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 come on. Come on. Duck is number one. Uh, I, I, I will not take further questions at this time. Any Big Ten people out there listening or watching, welcome to the era of the Duck being the best mascot in your conference. Period. Point blank. End of story. Uh, for the spring game, I think the thing I'm most excited to see off the top of my head is what happens in the secondary. Because I was talking about that on yesterday's show. Go check that out if you have not already. I you know did a whole breakdown and such, but I'll recap here if you missed it. The secondary's got so many bodies and so many guys who have got experience and or talent. And some guys are less developed than others. The way that that plays out, I, I'm most curious to see how they go against a receiving core that is going to be quite good. It, it is going to be a good receiving core for Dylan Gabriel to throw the ball to. But I, I don't know, you know, how one guy's going to look or another guy because, you know, we get expectations about transfer portal players or high school recruits and Sometimes it pans out, sometimes it doesn't, and that's what the spring game's for. April can't get here soon enough, huh? I think that's when the spring game is going to be. But that first question about the wholesale changes, like I said, to lead off the show, I don't expect to see any changes in recruiting. I don't expect to see any changes on defense, on offense, on, on nothing. Everything was there, and sometimes... It just doesn't go your way. The San Francisco 49ers, they had an injury, of course, with Brock Purdy a year ago, but got to the NFC Championship game. And sometimes you're good enough to win and you just lose. It's sports. It's single elimination once you get to that level of, of competing. And it's really, really hard. And, and I think the Ducks are are poised to, to look and feel the same as they did this year. And if they do, they'll be in the 12-team playoff and they'll have a chance to go play for a national championship. Let's get to a mailbag question here. This is from Zaheem Richards. Mailbag Q, how big of a jump do you think Mateo will make in his level of play from year one to year two? So Mateo came in as a highly recruited freshman. He was one guy in that 2023 cycle. I really wanted the Ducks to get. They're able to land him, and he plays as a true freshman, makes an impact. That's no surprise. He ended the year with just two sacks, and coming from the defensive end position, you know, two sacks as a freshman, again, uh, it's a pretty hard thing to obtain. That's the number I want to see him go, I, I want to see go up for him. That's a number I think can go up for him. So he's not as freakish of an athlete as Kayvon Thibodeau, because no one is, no one is Kayvon Thibodeau. Is that guy awesome in the NFL or what? Man, he's good. So is Panay Sewell. Panay Sewell, oh man, Panay is so good. That might be the best offensive tackle Oregon's ever had. When you look at what he's doing in the NFL, I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but uh, I mean, that dude, whew, he's already all pro and he will be for a while, but back to Mateo. So he had two sacks this year. It would have been three if there wasn't a flag thrown against Texas Tech in that game. So he was involved in some sequences, but he was not the dominant force that a Kayvon Thibodeau was. Few can be, 
But Mateo going forward, when you look at his physical makeup, he's 6'5", coming out of high school, was in that kind of 250, 260 range. I think that he's got to develop a bigger array of pass rush moves. You know, when we saw him in the spring game last year, I had a feeling he was going to play a good amount as a true freshman, and he did. PFF thinks he is better defending the run than he is getting after the passer. I tend to agree. I'm not someone who looks at a PFF grade and says, yeah, okay, whatever they say. I kind of think about what I saw, and if it, if it lines up, then that kind of bolsters the point. But if there's a discrepancy, you know, I'll, I'll look in just in what my own personal opinion is based on what I saw from a guy. But Mateo this year has one pass rush move, and this is where the Kayvon Thibodeau comparison comes into play. Mateo can be someone who has six to seven sacks next year. He could lead the Ducks in that department. He plays a position in which your most important function at defensive end or edge or the jack linebacker position, whatever you want to call it, your most important function is getting after the quarterback. Get pressure off the edge. The defensive tackles, they're not supposed to rack up stats the way that you know they necessarily did this year, right? Typically on a defensive line, your defensive tackles have got more actual tackles and your defensive ends have got more sacks. Now, every now and then, of course, there's you know an Aaron Donald type or Brandon Dorless in this instance who led the Ducks with five sacks. Popo Amavai had three as well. I think that for Oregon, being able to get more pressure off the edge is going to help their defense a lot. I think Mateo can make that leap. And like Thibodeau, he's got to develop a better array of pass rush moves. You know, another year in the weight room can only make him more physically ready to go up against uh, the tackles in the Big Ten. And there are some really good offensive lines in in our new conference. But for him, he had two sacks this year. Again, you know, would have been three. I'd like to see him at least double that. I'd like to see him at least double that and be a guy that defenses have to worry about that they have to do a little game planning around where they have to look at the alignment of Oregon's defense and say, okay, where's number 10? Where, where, where's number 10? We got to know where that guy is. And, and Oregon needs a better pass rush off the edge, especially without Brandon Dorless there, who sometimes lined up at defensive end. So he has to develop a better array of pass rush moves. He's, uh, you know, pretty acclimated to college football at this point. He played in, I believe, every game uh, in in this past season, and I fully expect him to do that again. But I think getting a little bit stronger, you can always get more explosive, but I don't think that's his problem. I, I think using his hands, that's something I hope he picked up from Dorless because Dorless, oh man, Dorless is elite. Dorless' hand hand usage is what I think makes him one, one of the more appealing defensive tackle prospects going into the NFL. The way that he just doesn't allow offensive linemen sometimes to make contact with him with his hand usage, that's where I think Mateo can improve. You know, when he doesn't have his, his one move, Thibodeau's was the speed rush, and Mateo's is kind of like that, but it's kind of like a, a hop acceleration when he you know he kind of like jumps into the air freezes and then accelerates down and tries to go attacking the outside shoulder of the offensive tackle if he can you know more routinely employ a spin move or an inside swim or you know get better at bull rushing in passing situations he can he can lead Oregon in sacks next year he absolutely could will he do that I don't know but I expect him to get better because like I was talking about with guys like Jalil Florence or Jeffrey Bossa there is a track record with this staff, which aside from Demetrius Martin, who's off to Michigan State, is entirely intact. It's entirely entirely the same. Their development has been has, has been really, really good. So I, I think that all of that remains in play. And I think that for Mateo, you know, assuming he, he stays healthy and whatnot, and he was healthy throughout the course of this year, the prospect of having him and Tuioti and Purchase, and then Elijah Rushing's coming in. You've got a Marion Winston in the room. There's no shortage of depth of guys that have either a combination of or one of experience and talent. I, I think that that room can be really good next year. I think Birch has got to be a leader. You know, he plays defensive end. The other guys are more at edge and they'll stand up from time to time. But I think that for the Ducks, they need Mateo to take a step forward or Tuioti or purchase or have rushing come in and be really good or marion winston maybe pff likes him more than the other edge defenders that that oregon has coming back this season outside maybe uh, of jordan birch depending on which metric you're looking at there but 
I, I think that for Mateo, the key is getting more pass rush moves, being able to employ a bull rush, and, and just continuing to improve and refine your game. And he can be a guy who has five or six sacks for the Ducks next season and generates even more quarterback pressures. Love me some good mailbag. This question came in via X, formerly known as Twitter, from Spice Allo Smith. Hopped right in the mentions. Great way to get into the mailbag. Hey, Spence, I really enjoyed listening to the show every day this season. Thanks for helping us get through uh, the get it, get us all through the week to game day. Appreciate you. What is your favorite Bo Nix moment from his two years with the Ducks? One favorite from each season. I'm going to double up or kind of have an honorable mention for 2023, but this was an easy one for me for the 2022 season. That Utah game, we didn't think Bo Nix was going to play. It looked like Chris Hudson had let it slip that Ty Thompson was going to be starting. Bo Nix could barely move, and he went out there, and in the guttiest, gritsiest fashion, I think that's the word, grittiest fashion, what you understand, he, he, he was toughness personified in that game. And I got to give credit to Rod Gilmore. I know that's not a popular thing to do amongst Duck fans, but he called it to ice the game. Third and one. Bo hadn't been able to move the whole game. He couldn't run outside the pocket but for one time, and he was limping around out there, just toughing it out, just a trooper and a half. And he mustered up the intestinal fortitude and courage to run the ball on third and one, it was a toss option with Noah Whittington, and they pulled a backside guard, and there was a lane for him to run through, and he ran, and he dove forward, got the first down, iced the game in what was the best win of Oregon's 2022 season, was beating that Utah team that went on to win the Pac-12 championship. And that moment, you know, Bo Nix had already won Oregon fans over. I think for me, that's when he cemented himself in my heart as a fan as someone who I will I, I will just love admire and respect forever because for him to to do it in that moment and, and to say not only am I going to play but when you need me the most I'm going to put my body on the line for you so that we can win the football game that's an awesome awesome thing in 2023 I think my favorite Bo Nix moment was the Oregon State touchdown right before the half to Troy Franklin. Oregon was up 14-0, trot out Camden Lewis after a good drive, and he misses a field goal. And Oregon State responds by going down the field and scoring a touchdown. And that in that moment, I remember texting my brother and a friend of ours, we're all Duck fans, and we're you know, rage texting during the game and everything. I remember texting him saying, this game just went from make a statement to just win. Well, turns out Oregon went back to making a statement because Knicks marched the Oregon offense right down the field. He started it with a scramble. He made a big time throw to Tez Johnson. And then the rolling right, throwback left, dangling ball in the air, as Jason Benetti described it on the Fox broadcast to Franklin for what was I think like a 37, 40 yard touchdown or so in that range. That moment was one where you went, oh, okay, Bo also is not going to let last year happen. Like in that moment, I knew we won the game. When it was 14-7, oh, we got questions now. Got questions. Oregon State gets the ball out of the half. Once that happened, I knew Bo Nix wasn't going to let us lose the football game. And that was a tremendous thing to watch. And then honorable mention uh, for my favorite Bo moment was his final moment as a duck you know, handing the ball off and taking a curtain call and dapping up all the guys and everything. It was awesome uh, in the Fiesta Bowl against Liberty. So definitely, definitely enjoyed that. I will answer this next question. But <laughs> only only because there is a Duck fan who apparently disagrees. Okay, this is from uh, Drastic underscore MC. If you could give your opinion on why Cam Ward is a bad fit with Mario, I'd appreciate it. Got a Duck fan in my life who doesn't get why I never liked Mario. Maybe it'll help if you say it. Okay, so 
here, here's, here's my stance. I, I am very happy, as I talked about at the beginning of this show. I'm very happy that Dan Lanning is Oregon's football coach. And though it stung at the time and there was an era of uncertainty that you don't care for as a fan when Mario left, I harbor no ill will towards Mario Cristobal because he helped build the Oregon program back up to the national level to make it relevant, establish a recruiting base and show what can be done in Eugene on that front and set the stage to bring in a guy who is clearly and demonstratively a better in-game coach and maybe almost, if not as good, of a recruiter. So I don't have that feeling. Like, I know that Duck fans sometimes will, you know, uh, I'll get messages from time to time, like, you see what Miami did? I'm like, yeah, I did. I'm more concerned about what Oregon's doing because that's that's what we're doing here. It's locked on Ducks, not locked on Canes. But uh, my, my opinion on Cam Ward going to Miami is Cam Ward is better than Tyler Van Dyke, the quarterback they had previously. My objection is from Cam Ward's perspective, that is not the place he should go. Now, the NIL opportunity, I have no idea what it is. I, I, I don't know. And maybe they're just the place that offered him the most. If you are talking about improving your development as a quarterback, as you prepare for the NFL draft, we have years of evidence that Mario Cristobal is not the guy to go to. That is my objection. Tyler Shuck had a chance to develop into the starter. He regressed over the course of his starting season. I know it was the COVID year and everything, but he was worse at the end of the year than he was at the start of the year and ultimately got benched in the Fiesta Bowl for Anthony Brown. And, and, and then they weren't able to have Ty Thompson ready when Anthony Brown was struggling and he's a true freshman. Okay, I'll give you some leeway there. But but then Anthony Brown over the course of the year, veteran quarterback, yeah, he didn't do a lot either. And then they go to they go to Miami, Mario and the staff, Tyler Van Dyke, looks like an NFL Heisman kind of caliber guy. And guess what? He's now at Wisconsin because he took a step back. This has been a consistent theme. Cristobal can do a lot of good things for your program. He'll recruit at a high level. And guess what? In college football, it's oftentimes about the Jimmys and the Joes, not the X's and the O's, but the X's and the O's still matter, like taking a knee. I can't believe he's done that twice, but that's just, you know, what he is at this point. And he knows how to build an offensive line, and he's going to build a physical football team. We, we, we saw all that happen. And th this notion that Mario is some disaster of a coach, look, he's got flaws. I'm, I'm not going to argue that particular point. That's the same guy who also went into Columbus and beat Ohio State. I, I watched Oregon play Ohio State two other times in my life. The Ducks did not win, but they won that game, and Mario was the head coach. And Joe Moorhead was the offense coordinator. And that was a pretty good that, that was a pretty good marriage there between those two as head coach and OC. So if Mario has the right coordinators, yeah, they can do well. But my objection is that if you were Cam Ward, I can't believe Cam Ward did not end up at Ohio State. There were rumors flying around that the interest was there. I don't know how that doesn't materialize. I, I mean, Cam Ward is better than Will Howard. He's got far more talent. And I think Cam Ward is an upgraded quarterback for Miami. I don't think that Cam Ward is setting himself up for success as best he can by going to play for the Hurricanes. So that's my take on, on that situation. Closing out with some hoops here. This question from Bud. It was a tough weekend for men's basketball. Yes, it was. With the Arizona schools at home this week, what are your thoughts on our chances for a sweep? And what are the critical factors, especially against the Arizona Wildcats? So if you're not aware of where the team is at right now, Oregon was 13-3 and going into last week and 5-0 and in Pac-12 play. And after going through the mountain schools, Boulder and Salt Lake City, Colorado and Utah, Oregon's 13-5 and and 5-2 and in Pac-12 play. Now, there are hopes for the NCAA tournament. They have not been completely dashed. There's a lot of season left. And if Oregon is able to win, it, you know, in the low to mid-20s, they'll have a really, really good chance of getting to the NCAA tournament. The problem they are having at the moment and are going to run into over the course of this year is quality wins. And beating either Utah, who's a field of 68 team, or Colorado, who's on the bubble for the NCAA tournament, would have been a quality win, particularly on the road. And the Colorado game, look, Oregon stinks in Boulder. That's just always been the case. Okay, 
you lose that one. But the Utah game, they should have won the game. They didn't execute down the stretch. Couldn't hit free throws, couldn't get stops, couldn't make shots when they had a chance. Dante had a couple looks. He played great. He's starting to look like himself. But he had a chance, you know, with a putback with less than 10 seconds left. He had a chance at the free throw line. It just, it didn't work out. And so losing that game sets Oregon back on their quest to return to the NCAA tournament, which they have missed each of the last two years. And and this team is so tremendously talented. And I think they did a a fantastic job in the offseason, just like Lanning and company, of addressing their needs. Last year, they had a historically bad shooting season. Well, they got a bunch of shooters now. And offense isn't their problem. Shellstad can shoot. Tracy can shoot. Kuznard has worked really hard. He can shoot. He was 7 of 10 from 3 on Sunday in Salt Lake City in the loss to the Utes. So that's not Oregon's problem. Brennan Rigsby, I think, is the best three-point shooting percentage guy on the team. He's over 40%. So they've got plenty of guys that can knock down threes. They can score. The problem Oregon is having, and this is the key going into these games with the Arizona schools, and playing Arizona this week is a, is is just a massive opportunity. First of all, you cannot lose to Arizona State at home. Oregon hasn't lost at home this year. That needs to continue. But beating a top 15 Arizona team would be so, I mean so big for the resume. It would be absolutely massive. The key to doing that is playing defense. They gave up so many easy buckets against Utah. It was really frustrating. And it's uncharacteristic for a Dana Altman team and why I have some confidence they are going to figure it out. Historically, his teams have been the inverse of what they are right now, which is, hey, they're getting stops. They play great defense, but they lost the game 66 to 64 or 60, you know, two to 58 or something because they couldn't hit shots. This team can score, but they've got to play defense. They've got to hunker down on the perimeter. Dante being in there as a shot blocker helps, but that's what they have to do. They, they've got to be able to get stops consistently, and that hasn't been the case this year. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.